remote island ham radios. How can we charge a ham radio battery from our car when our car's voltage is too dang high? And is there any courtesy on FT8? Let's dive in to those great questions this time on Mailbag Monday. What's happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike K at MRD. If you have an amateur radio related question for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at iCloud.com. I would love to hear from you. We've got three great questions today, but first, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to this father and son team. This viewer writes, Good day, Mike. Hope all is well. Just wanted to send you a thank you for taking my call yesterday when you were doing POTA. My son, who is 13, was sitting next to me when I heard your call CQ. He recognized your call sign and got so excited I made a contact with you. That's awesome. Both him and I watch all your YouTube videos and it was nice to finally get you on 10 meters. Again, thanks, KC1TMK and son. Guys, thank you so much for writing in. Uh, 10 meters the other day was not a happy camper and I only made 10 contacts and apparently you and your son were one of them. So just wanted to give a shout out to you guys. Thanks so much for watching and I appreciate the contact and you writing in. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> now, we've got one of these polarizing questions where there's a million different answers, but we're gonna go, we're gonna try and narrow it down. This viewer says, if you were traveling to a remote island and were going to bring a radio to activate some parks with no activations listed, would you go with a G90 or an FT891? I leave next week for a two week dive trip. That already sounds awesome. And since radio became a thing quickly, I was hoping to get some activations in while there. G90 seems like a nice all in one, but not sure I will love it. The 891 is great, but lacks an internal tuner, thus bringing extra gear. The power difference will not be as critical due to being able to skip over the Pacific Ocean back to the US. Antenna will be a chameleon tactical delta loop due to versatility for setups. I've been advised a wire will be hard to set up due to dense jungles or trying to throw too high into a palm tree. That is a doozy of a question, but I, I think you kind of already answered your question uh, in that the, let's start at the antenna, the tactical delta loop. I've not used much. I used Steve from temporarily off lines for a little bit. Uh, we were kind of playing around with it, but I believe that needs a tuner uh, for at least 40 meters because it's, it's a couple 17 foot whips so you'd have just a resident dipole uh, either way so I'd be remiss in saying I think tuners are overrated I, I don't think you need them get a resident antenna but in your case I'm kind of leaning towards the G90 with the tactical delta loop because the tuner inside of that is just so darn good especially if you're planning on running 40 meters uh, with the 891, you're going to need a bigger battery. It does draw more power, more current. Physically, the two radios are actually not too far apart. They're both kind of the same size and they both weigh kind of the same amount. But the current draw on the G90 is going to be a lot less. So you could bring a smaller battery or the same size battery with the 891, but you would get more operating time with the G90. Now, something to consider because you're going to re a remote island. And I'm gonna say bring the G90. But I would also say bring, if you have one, if you have like a small nine to one antenna with like maybe a 41 foot wire and some kind of little throw weight to get over a tree and some, and some arborist throw line or something, if you have the room in your gear to bring that antenna, I would try that. The reason being, when I'm activating, I don't like to fuss with tuning antennas when I wanna change the band, physically tuning the antennas, which you would have to do with the tactical delta loop. If you could still get an antenna wire up in the air, a nine to one specifically, that G90 tuner is so good if you wanna change bands just on the fly, because you have a nine to one setup, you just hit that tune button and your resonant, or tuned rather, matched on any other band you want. I mean, that thing will tune like 160 to 10 meters with a 41 foot nine to one. So I, I, I would struggle to bring one antenna 
personally, if, if I were in your shoes, I would struggle to bring just one antenna uh, because you never know. I, I would lean more towards a nine to one personally with the G90, even, even knowing that it might be hard to get up. For me, it's not hard to get a wire up in a tree. Uh, I've got a lot of practice doing it, but uh, maybe practice before you go. See if it's something you can easily do uh, before you go and maybe go that route. But uh, I've heard great things about the tactical Delta Loop. I don't have one, so I don't really have uh, uh, any way to say one way or the other. But uh, I mean, it'll be resonant on uh, all the bands except for like 80 and 40 you need a tuner for that. So yeah, G90, that's, that's my answer. I have spoken. Next, we got an interesting question from a Tesla owner. This viewer writes, long time viewer, first time emailer. <laughs> I'm planning on uh, installing a 2 meter 70 centimeter radio in my 2023 Tesla Model Y. My research has revealed the low voltage battery system in newer Teslas is quite a bit higher than a standard ICE vehicle between 15.7 and 16 volts. To avoid damaging the radio, my plan is to connect a BioNO battery. However, I would like a way to recharge that battery from the 12 volt outlet inside the car. Of course, as previously mentioned, that outlet is not exactly 12 volts. I'm looking for ideas to safely charge the BioNO from that outlet without damaging the battery or creating a carbecue. <laughs> I like that. Uh, would also like to extend an invite to activate uh, Park Kilo 2986, which is now US 2986, Bass Drop State Park with you. I need to get out to that park. It's only like two and a half hours for me. So yes, hit me up. I'd love to uh, poto with you. I'm a relatively new ham, currently tech, but studying for general. We can still rock 10 meters and would love a chance to learn how to poto from the master. Sincerely, Jimmy, KI5PRK. Well, you're already set up for success with your call sign because you're KI5 Park. So yes, I have an answer. And it lies in a Droke buck converter and a Paradan uh, LifePo 4 charger. So let's hop over on the bench and I will show you exactly how to set your radio up. So the couple things we need, the Droke buck converter and the Paradan radio battery charger. Now the Paradan radio output has either a barrel connector or a power pole. You can use either one. But it also comes with a cigarette lighter plug. Now, what you can do is simply cut this wire and put Anderson power poles on it. Now, I'm gonna show you a little bit different, but if you cut this wire and put power poles in it, you can plug this directly into your car's socket. And then, let's say this is now the cigarette lighter plug. We can plug the Droke buck converter into the cigarette lighter that's going into your car's socket. Now, I have my variable power supply set to 16 volts. So we can now lower the voltage on this down to something that the Droke, or excuse me, the Paradan radio charger will accept. Let's just say 13.8. Doesn't really matter too much. Now I'm going to use another cigarette lighter socket because I don't have power poles on this. But if there was a power pole on here, I would just plug it directly into the buck converters power pole. So let's just assume these are power poles. Now we can see we've got voltage on the uh, converter here. Now notice the battery. I have two wires, two reds and two blacks going into two power poles. The reason you need this, and depending if, if you have a BioNO battery that already has the two uh, different connectors, you can simply plug this barrel connector into the BioNO battery, and now you can see we're charging 3.12 amps, okay? Conversely, you can plug in the power pole if you want, if you're just charging it, and we're still getting current in. If you don't have a BioNO or you have a, a BioNO that has these terminals on it instead, here's where you'd wanna make that wiring harness and simply plug in the power poles to one of these, okay. Now this battery is pretty charged, so we're not seeing as much current going in, but it's still charging. And then you would plug your radio into this other power pole and life is good. You're done, that's all you have to do. You can charge this 
and run your radio at the same time in this configuration. Now do keep in mind, this wire is very thin. I just put this on for demonstration purposes. So make sure you use the appropriate gauge wire for the current draw that you're going to be using with your radio. Uh, but other than that, that's all you need to do. You ju we just went from 16 volts to 13.8 volts to 14.2 volts charging, and we can discharge off of this no problem at all. So there you go. Get two birds stoned at once, and now you can play radio and charge your battery from your higher voltage with those two little things right there. Thanks for writing in, and again, shoot me an email. I'd love to pot it with you. Next, we have a question about solar. This viewer writes, the sun is getting higher and the days longer. Being outside on the radio and feeling warm at the same time will soon be here. It already is for me. In view of that, would you be able to show us mere mortals how to link a solar panel through a controller to a battery whilst also being able to still be able to use the radio? Keep them coming. The complaint bits have me doubled over in laughter. <laughs> yes. Those are fun videos. And yes, I will absolutely show you how to hook up a solar charge controller system to your battery. It's stupid easy. Let's go outside and take a look. So here we are set out front. I've got a 100 watt panel from PowerFilm. And I've got a number of different batteries and charge controllers here set up. So we can show you a couple different ways. So a, a, charge controllers are gonna come in a few different ways. Some of them are gonna have a solar panel input, a battery output, and a load. You'll notice I don't have anything hooked up to the load. I personally don't like to pull from the load from the charge controller. I like to pull it directly from the battery. Here's another charge controller where you can see we have just the, you can't really see it, but it says PV there for photovoltaic, and there's the battery. There isn't even a load on this. And then in this box, I've got the Buddy Pole Power Mini 2 that does have loads. This is actually the only charge controller that I actually use the load for. Don't ask me why, that's just what I do. So the principles of this are kind of all the same. So I've got a few different batteries. I've got a BioNO here that has the two connectors. This is kind of made for charging. This is the power pole is made for your power out. They're both connected to the same place on the BMS. You can pull or charge from either one. It doesn't matter. And we've got this other battery here that we saw in the last clip that has the two wires, two red and two black, uh, going to two power poles. And then I also brought out a 100 amp hour BioNO with two power poles connected to this. So let me show you how we can wire this up. So the first way here, we'll take a look at this battery charge controller, which is actually RF quiet. And we'll plug in the solar panel to the charge controller. And then from to, from the battery side, we're gonna plug that into our battery now. I have an Anderson hooked up to this, so we're just gonna use this little barrel connector if I wanna say go into my BioNO battery. Now, we're charging this BioNO battery and I can take my load off of this power pole. Might not be able to see the display there, but battery's at 13.3 volts right now. Conversely, if we were to use this style battery where we've got the two prongs and the two wires, again, just like in the last clip, I would plug the charge controller into that. Now we're charging this battery and we can take our load off of the second power pole. And if we had a bigger battery that has these screw lugs on there, I have just two separate power pole wires going into it. Now, uh, I don't know if it makes any difference, but the bottom connector here, this is connected lowest to the battery. I would like to use that for my load. So I'm gonna take the one that's higher and I'm gonna connect the charge controller to that. And now we're charging this battery and I can use this for my load. Very, very easy. Now, if you're using something like the Buddy Pole Power Mini 2, this kind of makes life a little easier. You've got a thing that says battery, solar, and two loads. So I just have a little power pole going out to a yellow power pole. That's my solar in. So when I plug in the solar panel, it already knows, okay, it's got solar in. 
and then that's automatically feeding it to the battery, which I have a switch on here, so it might not be the easiest thing to kind of understand here, and I've got two batteries in here, but basically it's going from the solar panel through the charge controller and into the batteries, and when you want to pull a load off of it, you plug your load into the, either one of the load one or two slots, and you're done. And now for a little bit more, let's say, complex setup where you have a battery box with lots of different circuits and things, basically the signal path, if you will, is pretty much going to be the same. It just looks a little more complicated. So again, we've got a yellow power pole on the front that is going into this solar panel input. So when I plug the solar panel into the charge controller, you can see we're starting to charge. This battery part is going down through this switch and the positive wire on here is going through this fuse block down this wire, which is then connected to the power pole for the battery. So this red wire right here is the main wire that connects to the fuse block and everything goes through there. So basically what happens when, you, when, you're, when you're charging with solar on any of these setups we looked at, no matter how you connect it in any of these variables, what happens is the load is going to pull from whatever has the least resistance. And then the same thing with charging. So for example, we're putting in right now on this solar panel, uh, we're getting 3.8 amps of current in. So let's say my radio is hooked up and it's drawing one amp on standby. It's gonna draw that one amp from wherever, it doesn't matter. But once you start keying up, let's say you key up on CW and you're pulling 20 amps. Well, it's gonna pull, say, 16 amps from the battery and the other four amps from the charge controller, if that makes sense. Because all the power is, is going through this fuse block. So it's just gonna pull the power from wherever it can. Then when it goes back to receiving, the radio is gonna pull an amp. The charge controller is putting in four amps. So we're still gonna get three amps of current back into the battery, if that makes sense. Hopefully uh, you can understand my rhetoric here, but it, it's, it's pretty basic uh, in, in all honesty. It's a very basic DC circuit. So there you go. Hopefully I didn't uh, overcomplicate that too much. And now you should know how to wire up your solar system for portable solar ham radio. Thanks for writing in. Lastly, we have a question about everyone's favorite mode, FT8. This viewer writes, is there any kind of courtesy on FT8? I've noticed at times that someone tries to connect to me while I'm uh, on another contact. It seems like they give two or three tries, then off they go. Is there a way of not trying to interfere and just letting me know they would like a contact? As I usually do go search for them. So this is actually easier than uh, it sounds. So FT8 is designed in a way where it kind of doesn't matter because it's going to hear, FT8 hears everything. It's going to hear the person you're working and it's going to hear the people who are trying to work you. Though you may not be working those other people, you still see them, you can go back to them. And because FT8 just hears everyone, it's not really going to interfere with you usually. So let's hop over to FT8 and I'll show you what I mean. So the first thing I would recommend everyone do, just like we do in all things ham radio, find a clear frequency that you're gonna transmit on. So right now I'm at 2450, that looks pretty clear, that's been clear for a while. Click this hold transmit frequency button because that way you, you kinda, rarely would you wanna actually like zero beat, like transmit and receive where someone is transmitting. So if we all have our own clear frequencies and we hit this hold transmit frequency button, say I click on somebody. Let's just click on this guy here, okay? Notice I'm still transmitting here and I'm listening over here. So when it comes around, even if someone else is trying to work him, they're transmitting, let's say over here, we're only listening to this guy. So he might be receiving several different stations, which he is right now. Someone else is trying to work this guy. He can see me, but he's not coming back to me. 
So I could just sit here and keep calling, and it's not really going to interfere with him. Now, if this uh, KA9 Fox was also transmitting where uh, N2 BDP was transmitting, zero beating him, that might interfere with another station who might be uh, working on the even. So he, uh, N2 BDP is working on the even. So if I were transmitting here on the odd, someone else can be calling CQ here on the odd. So there's really, we're working, we're working split and we're working two different times. We're working the odd and the even. So by always having your clear frequency and holding it there, we're usually not gonna be interfering with anybody. And he might not be hearing me, so that's fine. So let me go back to my uh, clear frequency. And I'm just gonna hit enable CQ. Actually, let me change that to CQ. And now I'll start calling CQ, and we'll see what happens if, if I get a few stations coming back to me. So now we've got K4QAL. Notice he's transmitting over here, and I'm transmitting over here. I'm transmitting even, he's transmitting odd, because I have transmit even set. He clicked on my call sign, so WSJTX will automatically, even if he was transmitting even first, it would uncheck this box, and he'd be transmitting uh, odd now. No one's transmitting where I am still, so I'm clear. He's got a nice, good signal, and we just made the contact. Now, if you have a bunch of stations calling you, once you get your 73, I just hit enable transmit again. Even if I have a bunch of a bunch of stations calling me, because they might have called you a few times and gave up. So my thinking is, well, if I go back to like the first guy on the list, say there's a whole bunch of red here, a whole bunch of call signs. If I double click that guy who called me first, well, he might be working someone else and I'm not gonna make any contacts. So by just hitting enable transmit, when, when I'm the one calling CQ, it's just gonna automatically go because I have auto sequence and CQ first checked. It's gonna pick up the first one that it hears who comes back to my CQ. And even though I'm receiving down here, it doesn't matter because WSJTX is gonna hear this whole thing. So here, uh, KA3E is now working me way down here. He's transmitting down here. I'm transmitting up here. So yeah, w FT8 is kind of the wild, wild west. And it looks kind of confusing at first, but when you understand the ins and outs and the odd and the even and the time splits and the frequency splits, there's not, there's really not as much QRM as you would actually uh, expect. So here, now we've got another guy calling us while I'm still working that KA3E. I just finished KA3E. He's coming back to me sending his 73 while that K8TAC is still trying to work me. That's just kind of how the sequence goes. And I don't even know where this guy, he's on 722. So somewhere around here, that K8TAC is transmitting and trying to get me, but he's still not interfering with anything. Now, if he were transmitting where this other guy was, then yeah, he'd be interfering with his transmission. And now WSJTX just picked up K8TAC and it switched his uh, my receiving frequency to uh, 722 here where he's transmitting. So yeah, again, there's not as much QRMing and interference as it looks. So yeah, I think there's a bit more etiquette on FT8 than uh, what might appear on the surface. Now, if people are just transmitting on top of your frequency and on top of your time, then yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of a dick move. But uh, other than that, there's, <sighs> It's a pretty, it's a pretty safe space for QRM. So, thanks for writing it. I hope that helps. And guys, if you have amateur radio-related questions for me, don't hesitate. Shoot me an email: k8mrd at icloud.com, and you may have one of your questions featured on an episode of Mailbag Monday. My name is Mike K8MRD. This is Ham Radio Tube. Seventy-three for now. <laughs>